Hello. Uh, so um, when I when I go to parties and I'm talking to people and you get to that part in the conversation, so Suzanne, what do you do for a living? Uh, and I say, theoretical quantum physicist. Uh, I get a few different reactions. Um, usually I get a lot of the kind of polite, oh, right, 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 right. Um, I did have one woman, when I said theoretical quantum physicist, gave me this enormously pitying look. I just said, oh, would you not retrain? Uh, but I mean, I'll freely admit that when I say my job title, it's, it's really unclear what I actually do day to day. Um, and obviously it depends on physicist to physicist. Um, personally, I tend to draw a lot of, spend a lot of time drawing graphs of things that haven't happened yet. It's kind of like being psychic, only if psychic made predictions like, Brian, John is going to punch you. And then spent the next three years writing articles about why John should punch Brian, what would happen if John punched Brian, some of the economic impacts of John punching Brian, all hoping that John will read these and go, that's, that's a brilliant idea, I'm going to go punch Brian now. <laughs> And that's just the theoretical part of my job description. Uh, there's also the quantum part, um, and quantum physics has a reputation for being generally a bit odd. Um, and I've worked in this field for a couple of years now, and my pre professional opinion is that's, that's pretty much on the money. Um, I don't think quantum physicists do ourselves a lot of favors for our image, because we come up with these really weird thought experiments. So what we do is we come up with the scenario, and we spend some time reasoning logically what, what would happen if this was real. So it's kind of like what I did earlier when I talked about going to parties and people, <laughs> and people talking to me. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, we, we kind of spend some time bigging up quantum physics, but the amazing things you can do with quantum computers, quantum technologies. We tend to gloss over some of the wee little road bumps, some of the things quantum physics really can't do so well. Um, one example of this would be, like, for example, transport. Now, I'm not talking about a kind of some highfalutin concept here. Um, for example, I'm going to transport this from here to here, classically, so not quantumly, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you try and do that with a, something quantumly, so if you try and do that with like a, just a single atom, basically, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> There's a few problems. First of all, it's really hard to move something that's both a wave and a particle at the same time. It's also really hard to move something when you're not exactly sure where it is. <laughs> so say you have your single atom and you put it in, um, say, like an atom bucket. <laughs> you know it's in the bucket somewhere, but that's, that's the best you can do. So say I want to move it from this atom bucket to another atom bucket that I have over here. right? Unless you do this incredibly, ridiculously, precisely, the end result is going to be that your atom is basically going to be in both buckets at the same time. <laughs> kind of embarrassing. Uh, so what you do at the, at the end of the experiment is you look in your second bucket to see if it's worked. Um, and there's a couple of possible outcomes here. You could look in, and it's there. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Or you could look in, and the very act of you looking will make it appear in the first bucket. <laughs> so you're back to where you started from. Um, I mean, this basically sums up quantum physics for me. <laughs> you, can, you can take incredibly difficult things and make them incredibly straightforward. But it will also take incredibly straightforward things and make them incredibly difficult for you. So it's kind of like someone with a PhD who can't open doors. <laughs> That's why I was here like three hours early. <laughs> But I mean, you can probably take some solace in the fact that if quantum physics is confusing for you, it's also confusing for us. There was a survey done, published recently, um, done by this guy called Anton Zeilinger. And he's like super famous in quantum physics. <laughs> uh, if that's a thing. Uh, basically, he is the Arnold Schwarzenegger of quantum teleportation. Uh, he is actually also Austrian as well, so if you close your eyes, like the Terminator is teaching me quantum physics. It's really cool. um, but he went to a conference of quantum physicists, and he did a survey of all the people there, and uh, he's published some results for this. So he published some results about the foundational attitudes towards quantum mechanics. 
And he asks questions like, do you believe that physical objects have their properties well defined, independent of and prior to measurement? <laughs> now for those playing along at home, um, <laughs> the answers were about 50-50 split between yes and no. <laughs> But of course, that wasn't simple enough for the quantum physicists. There were a few write-in replies as well, um, such as, what is well-defined? Um, and another person wrote, bad question, because it presumes local realism and ignores entanglement. <laughs> Should have known. <laughs> So, I mean, basically, if you set us homework, you'll get it back with corrections. <laughs> um, but I, I really recommend you download this paper. It's really good if you happen to be at a party and you run into your local theoretical quantum physicist. <laughs> you can basically cheat, cheat your way through the entire conversation with this thing. You know, you can come up with things like, well, I mean, my preferred interpretation of quantum mechanics is the Copenhagen interpretation. 42%. <laughs> Although the De Bruyne bomb interpretation has a kind of a whimsical charm. Zero <laughs> percent. Um, but, I mean, Anton Zellinger actually put a little comment after that particular question saying, um, and he supported this with two full references, that he regretted not including the shut up and calculate interpretation. <laughs> it's actually a real thing. Um, but. We've gotten around things like the transportation problem with a few tips and tricks. Um, there's one which I particularly like. I did a variation of this during my PhD. Uh, but basically, instead of the two atom buckets that I had earlier, you have three atom buckets. Simpler already. <laughs> so you start with your atom in the first atom bucket, and you want to move it to the third atom bucket. Now, your first instinct is going to be, I want to move it from the first to the second, right? Which would be great if this was a classical problem, but it's not. <laughs> so what you actually want to do is you want to move it from the second bucket to the third bucket, and only then do you move it from the first bucket to the second bucket. <laughs> and if you do this correctly, it will jump from the first bucket to the third bucket, and it will never actually be in the second bucket. And that's all kind of a bit counterintuitive sounding, but actually this, this is a real thing, this, this actually works. I mean, I've seen it working, I've actually done it myself. And of course, by done it myself, I mean, I've, I've drawn graphs of how this would work. <laughs> and I've published papers about it working. And now I just need to find someone to punch Brian. <laughs> Thanks very much.